We're here today with Wharton Marketing Professor Peter Fader and Wharton Professor of Operations, Information, and Decisions, Senthil Viragavan, to talk about their new paper, which discusses dynamic pricing of Major League Baseball tickets. Thanks for being here. It's great to be with you, Rachel. So Thanks first off, could you guys talk to us a little bit? Give us a brief summary of the paper. What did you study and what were you looking at? So in uh, Major League Baseball, in professional sports, in the entertainment world in general, there's been this, this great awakening that you actually have to care about the business side of the business. It's not just a matter of putting the best players on the field or the best performers on stage. And of course, a big part of that is pricing. So for years and years, uh, again, all these different kinds of companies have just come up with arbitrary prices, and they've kind of relied on secondary markets in order to kind of uh, reach the right, the right equilibrium. Well, it's great to see that a lot of Major League Baseball clubs, among others in this, this general area, are finally getting smart and saying, we want to take control of this. We want to set the right prices. And part of that means dynamic pricing. Part of that means adjusting the prices over time, uh, some, uh, charging uh, different prices to different people, depending on the nature of the game and so on. Uh, so a lot of clubs have been just trying it out, uh, but not a lot of them have actually stepped back to say, is it working? Can we do it better? What's the incremental impact of one kind of pricing policy or another? So we were very fortunate to be able to work with a club that was asking those kinds of questions. And through a, just a really clever data set and some pretty clever modeling, I think we came up with some pretty good answers. Great. And Santa, do you have anything to add? It's a, it's a very interesting problem. It's a, it's a confluence of uh, exciting cutting-edge research um, with a practical application that goes directly onto the field, literally in this case. Right. right. So. And now, so can you guys talk to us a little bit about, you found some interesting key takeaways from this paper that might surprise a lot of people who are out there buying baseball tickets, or maybe not. One of the things that we found out is uh, people talk a lot about dynamic pricing. It has a lot of customer response to dynamic pricing. A well-chosen price, even if it's static, does as well. That's one thing we learned from this project, um, which we had some inkling about, but we were really surprised how well a well-chosen static price did. Um, that's one of our surprising findings. And of course, there's the flip side to it as well, which is dynamic pricing isn't a panacea. Just because you're varying the prices doesn't mean you're necessarily making more money. And in fact, in this particular case, if we look at the dynamic pricing policy at this one club followed over this one portion of a season, they actually uh, they actually lost money uh, relative to uh, to the, the the static po policy that they had at the beginning. So it's it's finding that just right balance between what should be dynamic and as Senthil said, in some cases, if we can pick the just right prices, why even bother changing things at all? Now, but I would think that picking the just right price is easier said than done. <laughs> that is true. Um, if uh, if there was a magic bullet, so to speak, and that's distributable, we would be able to do that, right? Uh, I think context-specific application uh, is very important here. Um, it's, it's a relationship, as uh, Pete often talks about, between the customers you want to serve and the team you want to run and the organization you want to run. And in this case, that data is useful to understand what kind of policies would work. Yeah, we can improve but it's very specific. Data has that information. We can convert the data into good pricing policies. And I think that's why it's such a great collaboration over here, because I do spend my time thinking about the relationships and thinking about all the nuances of where demand comes from. And Senthil and his colleagues in our OID department spend a lot of time thinking about optimizing. And very often, each of us doesn't do justice to the other side. So I'll build these really great descriptive models, but then I fall short on the so what. And very often, folks in the optimization world will build overly simplistic models because it enhances the optimization part. This is that just right combination where we have a really a rich description of how people are buying tickets when and, and for what sections and what are they willing to pay for. So it's a nice story about customer behavior, but it lends itself pretty well to the optimization as well. That's right. As I said, it's a confluence of how people behave and what models you can run in the background and how you can bring it to uh, business applications today. Yeah. And now you guys had some pretty interesting ways. Like one thing that I think really comes out in the papers, there's lots of different ways that a baseball team in particular, and probably really anyone that wants to do this, could dynamic price. I mean, so you talk about the seat and you talk about how well the team is doing and a bunch of different ways to do this. 
So we talk about it at a couple of different levels. So as you just mentioned, Rachel, a lot of it would be the factors that should be taken into account when deriving a dynamic pricing policy. And you just mentioned a, a few of them there. And it's great that this is not an academic exercise that a lot of professional sports teams and, and, and other kinds of businesses are starting to take those factors into account. So one is on the input side, what factors should we be looking at and how do we adjust for them? But then there's on the kind of on the output side in terms of setting the policies. And again, this is Cynthia's mm -hmm. expertise about, you know, should we be looking ahead or not? Well, anyway, you could talk more about the, the, the nature of the different kinds of pricing policies. And to me, it's been an education just to think about the different ways that we can go out there with policies. I mean, we're, we're all learning different things from this problem. As we talked about, it's very cross-disciplinary. And uh, one of the things is, how far do you look ahead when you set your dynamic pricing policies? Do you look ahead 10 games, three games, how often do you change? Um, how do you communicate that? Um, and these things matter, and these things are just customer responses, and that's going to feed back into the policies that you're going to come up with. So people think of dynamic pricing as an evil or a, or a, or a, or a panacea, we talk about it. The truth is somewhere in the middle. It's You can go with the same solution and do it poorly because of how you used information. So in this case, we, for example, found out if there is more people in the group that's buying tickets, they are more likely to buy from certain sections of the stadium and uh, you know better sections of the stadium. That was surprising to me. Uh, as a marketing person, maybe that's not uh, immediately surprising, but that's not what the models usually assume. So it becomes relevant to understand your customers, to take the data, from your, uh, from your understanding of the problem and apply it and start thinking about dynamic pricing. So how many games you should look at? Should you look at your opponents? Should you look at the day of the game, the weather? All these things matter. Should you revisit if they go into a bad streak? <laughs> yeah, when you go into a bad streak, then you cannot be charging too high. So you have to think about revising prices downwards. I mean, just kind of think about sometimes there's a team that could be, you know, they could, they could say in April, well, this is the team that's going to the World Series or the Super Bowl or whatever you want to say. But then by September, they've tanked. Well, that's uh, actually one of the issues that happened in this case. Oh, okay. So actually, the, the whole setting of the model is kind of interesting, that this particular Major League Baseball team didn't use dynamic pricing for the first half of the season. So we were able to calibrate all of our demand and, and response models based on what we see for you know the first 40 games or so. And then we can project what would happen in the latter part of the season if they didn't introduce dynamic pricing. So we have this really good baseline about what sales would have been, and we look at the difference in order to say how well did the dynamic pricing work. Well, we didn't know it at the time, but the team did not do well in the second part of the season. They, they went way, way, way down. And so it's not so much that we can blame the dynamic pricing policy, but the team went into an, an area that we hadn't observed in the first part of the data set. So, you know, that's just the, the, the nature of, of building a model and kind of rolling with it, that sometimes things will happen out there that you can't control, you can't anticipate. Right. Now tell me a little bit, so if I'm a, I'm another Major League Baseball team or even a Minor League Baseball team or anyone where this could be any, I'm assuming this could be applied any number of ways. I know you've done something with some things with like concert tickets, things like that. In fact, so, Peter and I both right, have uh, worked together. on uh, nonprofits, uh, which I looked at it too. That's exactly, I mean, you, you are a baseball team, you're a minor league team, you're an international team, you know, a soccer team, cricket team, or, or even a nonprofit organization. You have already the data that can tell you what, how you can think about this problem. Where we come in and tell you is this information is very key, it's important, and this is how we can use this information and adjust your policies. Um, so on one hand, the, I think the, the framework that we've built is fairly general because we're using pretty common set of factors and, and data structures and so on. But the specific results, I'm not sure that we'd want to uh, generalize from those. That's, that's I think the particular weight that different factors might have, the, the, the relative differences between different kinds of pricing policies, that is going to be context specific. But I am pretty confident that if we took the overall model and then recalibrated it in another setting, it would continue to work well, maybe with just 
slightly different results. But I'm wondering, so if I'm re- if I'm an organization, I'm looking at this, how might I practically apply the research? Well, part of it is just gaining the overall understanding. So before we even worry about specific estimated coefficients or, or any of the, the, the numbers that are in the paper, uh, as, as we've said before, just thinking about what are the factors that you'd want to take into account? Uh, and operationally, can you create a situation, again, that we were fortunate to have here, where we have this control condition where there was no dynamic pricing going on, so we can get a clean read. So once we kind of press that button and start it, we can understand uh, what's happening, what's attributable to it. So there's things both in terms of what we put into the model as well as just the overall way that it, it, it played out in practice that, that can be generalized. And I hope that folks would focus more on, on those kind of uh, operational factors more than specific results arising from it. That's a very important point, actually. Um, well, a lot of times people say, yeah, you could do this, but what if it happens? What if something else happens? And by doing this kind of experimental database study, you're able to answer those questions using counterfactuals. Yeah, what if the team got on a hot streak? This is what you should be doing. What if the show is so successful? Or what if the lead actor leaves? Um, what do you do? And we, we can have answers to these kind of questions using the model uh, applications. And as Pete said, the actual d- results may vary from case to case, but the fundamental application remains the same. Now, is there a story in the media that you guys think really relates to this research that really kind of puts it into a new light or just relates to it in general? Well, I think there's a, 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 a not only a current story but an ongoing story. As, as I said at the outset, just, just all this, this consternation among uh, professional sports organizations about the existence of and the profitability of secondary markets. So a lot of this project arose from a, a large-scale project I had done with Major League Baseball. I was very pleased that, that uh, one of the clubs wanted to go further with it. In that project with MLB, the, the question is, uh, should they continue to use StubHub as their exclusive secondary ticket provider? Uh, and uh, most of the teams agreed to do so. Some of the teams opted out, including the New York Yankees. And uh, just this week, the Yankees uh, uh, changed their policy on that, and they're, they're coming back to StubHub, albeit with conditions. But, it's, but the, the point is that it, this, this whole situation is far from settled. So you have a lot of teams that are doing the kinds of modeling experiments like we see going on over here. Uh, and as a whole, uh, it, 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 there's going to be just a, a lot more changes taking place. We hope that it's not just trial and error. We hope that it's going to be the clubs inclu- and the secondary ticket providers uh, just getting smarter uh, and, and, and actually in some sense – reducing the opportunities for arbitrage and some of the game playing that goes on just by anticipating what the right prices will be and how they'll vary under different kinds of circumstances. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty much in agreement with that. I mean, do you feel like the secondary markets have really put a lot of pressure on the teams or on concert, or on, ba- or on concert promoters or anybody just to, to really look more closely at this from their perspective just because they know the secondary market is out there and it's something that's very and, relevant to anyone who's buying tickets. For in anything. a way, the existence of the secondary markets uh, has, and the success of them has been a great wake-up call uh, to these organizations. The fact that they're now p- putting so many resources internally into doing the kind of modeling and experimentation that we're endorsing here. It used to be that they would take all the analytic talent and save it for the money ball people. Let's go out there and just find the best players. Right. But now they want to find the best analysts who can help them uh, sell tickets at the right prices to the right people. It's good to see that they're, dare I say, yeah. leveling the playing field. Exactly. I mean, at some level, um, they own the content um, that, as we speak, right? They own the content. They can control the content. They can. They understand their content better. So who else, right, can benefit more uh, from these kind of pricing adjustments than the content providers themselves? Right. I mean, you, and you can get the best players, but you still have to get butts in the seat. Now, do you feel like there are, um, I think, I mean, I think there's a lot of views about dynamic pricing out there. You've got people that think it's the worst thing in the world and people think it's the best thing ever. I mean, do you think there's other misconceptions that this research kind of dispels? One of the things that, again, we going back to what we got surprised by is uh, you could do very well with the well-set static pricing. Again, well-set, right. uh, that is a hard problem. So dynamic pricing gives you a flexibility to adjust, um, and this is very important. And actually, it can help a team to reach out as uh, fans and consumers too. It's not necessarily the bad thing 
for both the team and the fans and the consumers. That might be the biggest revelation, not just from this one study, but from this, this broader project that I was involved with. Uh, when I first started talking to Major League Baseball, uh, they were very reluctant. A lot of the clubs were very reluctant to try dynamic pricing. It seemed, first of all, scary. It's unknown. Uh, second, they, they, they worried about some kind of backlash that fans would feel that they're being gouged and so on. It's been great to see uh, how well-received dynamic pricing has been. The clubs have been careful about it, uh, and so they haven't uh, overreached. There's been very few stories about any kind of backlash. And from the fan side, we're getting used to it. We're understanding that the, the, what we see, whether it's with, with airplanes, now with professional sports, when it comes to uh, ride-sharing services, that, 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 that dynamic pricing is, is here to stay. And as long as companies are doing it in a smart way, and as long as they have the long run in mind and not trying to squeeze as many dollars as they can right now, it really can be in, every, in everybody's best interest. Now, what's next for this research? Where are you going to go next with it? Lots of directions, actually. I mean, we uh, we have interest from many places, so we are actually uh, we just hope there is more time for, uh, to do all this stuff and yeah. and better data too. Yeah. Uh, we were very fortunate to get the, the data that, that this one club provided, but there's so much more that they could provide. So there's other sources of revenue, such as uh, concessions and merchandise that they're selling. There can be other sources of of customer behavior. In this case. We didn't have full granularity to track exactly which household was buying which ticket at which time. So if we could link that together and come up with a better notion of what the, the true demand is. So in, in many ways, this is, the, this is the tip of the iceberg. This is the top of the first inning. Uh, I think it's going to be a <laughs> long fun, game yeah. ahead for uh, understanding the role of dynamic pricing in this setting and so many others. Well, and I guess we'll see you back for your next, your next base hit. So, <laughs> Seth Phil Peter, thank, for, thank you so much for being thank here with so us. Thank you so much for having us. <laughs>